morning, Rod. Thank you for joining us. So, Chris, we'll let you take over. Okay. Thank you, Francisque. Morning, Ross, or afternoon, Ross, as, as we afternoon. are, because I'm with, I'm with you yeah, if you're so in the UK. Are you in London? Yeah, close. There we go. So, yeah, we're, we're on the same time zone, at least. Everyone else is up at 7 a.m. in California. But thanks so much for, for joining us. I appreciate how busy you are uh, and how meetings are piling up left, right and centre. So um, it's a real pleasure to have you kicking off day two with us on Race Industry Week. Um, got lots of exciting stuff to talk to you about. It really is a hugely exciting time for F1. I mean, we're a little over two months away from seeing brand new cars uh, hitting the track for the first time. And yet we still haven't finished this season. So I want to focus initially on this season because what a season it's been. Just how excited are you for the upcoming final two races and, and finding out who's going to be world champion between Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen? Because personally, having worked in it, this has felt like a roller coaster intense season. Uh, you know, where does it rank uh, kind of on your book? Well, we're blessed. Uh, it's definitely one of the best years uh, since I've been involved in Formula One. I think the great thing is when you've got um, uh, you've got a championship fight between two drivers of different teams, uh, because you've got all the of um, the teams fighting each other as well as the drivers fighting each other, and obviously that's uh, Toto and Christian have been great entertainment as well all season. Um, I think when it was uh, Nico and, and Lewis, it wasn't quite the same. It was almost like kissing your sister. Uh, so, um, but now we have a full-on, full-on uh, battle between you know, every mechanic, every engineer, uh, every team, each team principal, and 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 of course the two drivers. So it's a great, uh, great season. And the wonderful thing is, people ask me who's going to win, and I don't know. Uh, and that's what makes it a great championship. There's no way of telling. And it's, it's sort of ebbed and flowed and uh, gone through these cycles. And, um, you know, with, with a sport like Formula One where the cars are quite influential, you just don't know who's going to pull the rabbit out of the hat uh, in terms of improvements or uh, little tweaks that are so critical at this stage. And um, I'm off to Saudi in the morning and uh, that's a fabulous new track which no one's raced on before so that's gonna uh, that's gonna be an interesting challenge we've got the modified abu dhabi track which is really uh, i think a good step forward over what we had before which is um something we've helped uh, advise on so um yeah great great end to the season well having this uncertainty over who's going to win it is something that i know fans like to have that formula one wants to have too so in a, in a strange way, when we look to 2022 and it's all going to be changing, um, it could seem like a bit of a risk. But could you explain maybe, I'm, I'm, Pat's going to join us on one of the, the later sessions to maybe explain in detail, but can you explain just the reasons why the 2022 cars are going to be massively different? Well, of course, it, it seems a little um, strange to be changing the cars with such a fantastic season. Um, but what you constantly hear is as soon as a driver gets near another car, then they lose so much performance uh, in the wake, in the aerodynamic wake. These cars rely on the aerodynamic performance enormously, but they've, uh, they've evolved into something hypercritical and they just simply don't work when they're operating in the wake, uh, in the flow of another car. And so they're almost self-defeating. And those wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles um, are sort of not that, that common. I mean, yeah, we've had we've had a bit of it, but uh, as soon as you get two cars of similar performance, they, the one following simply can't follow. It um, it loses performance, and there's quite a dramatic difference in the aerodynamic performance of a following car uh, for next year. And we just feel it's a much better platform for us to operate on, because the situation we have now is only going to get worse. It's progressively got worse year on year. And there's no reason it won't it won't get even uh, worse in the future. So, uh, and uh, it was time for a change. It should have come in this year, as you know, but with the COVID situation, we delayed it for a year. There's quite a lot of other changes with the regulations as well, which I think will be influential. We've got 18-inch um, wheels, um, different tires, quite a lot of controlled components on the car. Trying to leave as much scope um, 
so that uh, you know there, there still is this wonderful sort of technical battle, but it doesn't overwhelm. And um, but there's a lot of items that we've we've standardised or controlled because they're simply areas where the fans have no knowledge or the teams don't make them aware of it. And um, you know, a few years ago, we standardised most of the gearbox components and didn't make a jot of difference to the fans. It just made it uh, a slightly closer competition. Um, and that's the sort of thing we want. We want to have uh, we, we want to have competition areas the fans can understand, they can see, the media can discuss, because uh, we think that's a fabulous part of Formula One. We don't want competition in reducing the friction of a gearbox by a quarter of a percent and spending out half a million dollars on it. It's not, uh, we're trying to shape it in a different way and that's all part of what we're doing. Well, speaking of shaping it, how did it come about? Because like you say, it should have been this year and it's, it's been delayed for a year, but what was the process like to get to this stage? Because it, it feels like F1 as a company, um, rather than as a sport, if that makes sense, uh, was far more involved than in the past when it used to just be the regulator and the teams that would kind of decide which way they wanted to take the rules. Um, it's a good point. I think um, when when Liberty uh, acquired the commercial rights for Formula One, um, I I I'd been I'd retired uh, been retired for three years, uh, but it was the one thing that I felt could motivate me and was of interest to me, which was to look at how we shape Formula One for the future and how we create a structure that's constantly looking at the way Formula One's evolving and helping uh, give it some direction. Because until then, the rules had quite frankly been fundamentally decided by the teams. And the competitors deciding the rules is not always the best solution. And, um, and the FIA uh, at that point didn't have the resources to look at the problems directly they had to take the information from the teams so we said about building a team and I'm glad you'll be talking to Pat because he headed that team um, to to look at the cars we had and try and decide how we could uh, improve the quality of racing both from the design of the, the car and the economic uh, environment that the teams operate in because there was a massive disparity in what a top team could spend uh, compared to even you know, a mid, mid range team. A year ago, 18 months ago, at this stage of the season, Red Bull or Mercedes could be pouring hundreds of millions into the championship to try and make sure they could win it. Uh, and they can't do that now. There's a, there's a cost cap and they're constrained in how much they can spend. And so, and you know, we believe it will bring closer racing. It will bring economic stability to Formula One, um, closer competition throughout. Um, so it's not a revolution, it's an evolution, but the things which um, for once there's been some resource put into this uh, objective. Uh, and I'd like to say independent resource because our objective is just to make the racing better. We make the racing better we make it more engaging. We get more fans, it improves the commercial landscape for everybody, including ourselves. But we have to keep the integrity. We can't, we can't um, distort or falsify the, the competition. So um, the first time ever, the commercial rights holder has actually put their money where the math is. Uh, it's funny talking money and you brought up the budget cap. It is something I wanted to focus on for maybe people who weren't aware of F1 budgets before. Um, $145 million was the budget cap for this year. Meant to be a bit of a sliding scale to bring it down even lower in future. And that's a big, big step, isn't it, for, for some teams. But why do you think it was so important in the sense of then still, allow, still allowing some technical freedom? Because there'll be a lot of engineers on, on this call listening that will be thinking, well, I don't want you to stop teams sort of being creative and innovative. Yeah, I think you go two routes, really. One is you go to standardised cars. If you want to control the cost, you go to standardised cars. And that's definitely not what we wanted. Or you try and constrain the resources which teams are allowed to, to use, but allow them within that, that constraint to, to do what they want within the regulations, of course. And we've chosen the latter because it means we'll have, uh, we'll have different cars on the grid. 
cars will still have the identity of the teams. Um, it's $145 million uh, this year, which is still a huge amount of money. Um, on top of that, the uh, driver fees, uh, that's not including the driver fees, and that's a, a debatable topic. That's a discussion we're having with the teams in the FIA at the moment, how, how, what may happen with that in the future. Um, so, uh, but, you know, on this, in, in a, on a life-for-life -life basis, I would say the top teams are probably spending getting on for twice that in the past. And it's still a budget which, let's say, a, a very good midfield team can aspire to um, with the prize money they get from Formula One and the sponsorship they can attract, then you know, there's a lot of teams that will be able to reach that sort of level of expenditure. Uh, and therefore, we believe we'll have, take a year or two to adjust, but we'll have um, many more frontline competitive teams in the form one than we've had in the past. And I think another way you want to do it um, from looking at the rule changes, and there's a lot of them for us to talk about here for, for next year, is the sliding scale of aerodynamic kind of testing time. Um, was that a US, a US inspired change in many ways? I know it's not quite a draft system, but it, it is a way of kind of helping provide greater scope for improvement, I guess, for the worst performing teams. Well, Chase, Chase Carey, who's still our uh, non-exec chairman and um, still very close to Formula One, um, he was encouraging some form of sort of gentle correction um, in the sense that we, we didn't want to have a handicap system or a penalty system. We didn't feel that's what Formula One should be about. But there is, um, you know, this is a gentle correction. So if you're at the back of the grid, you have a bit more aerodynamic time, you have a bit more aerodynamic resource than the teams at the front of the grid. So it's a gentle correction. Um, but of course you have to use that, you have to use it properly and uh, effectively or else it will make little difference. Um, but it's the first time really Form 1 has ever applied that sort of gentle correction. It's quite a mild slope at the moment. Um, and, um, it's, uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how it evolves. But um, yeah, nothing major, but I think something which uh, we'll be watching and studying and seeing how impactful it is. Well, it, it's all clearly intended to try and improve the sporting spectacle, basically, and reward sporting excellence over financial excellence and, and the spending power of some teams over others. But the sporting challenge itself looks like it'll be slightly different as well next year. I mean, for anyone who, again, maybe doesn't know an F1 weekend, previously Thursday at each venue was a media day. Friday was a day of practice for two sessions. Saturday was when qualifying was held and Sunday was the race. Netflix made me famous for just explaining that to people before. But can you talk us through what will change next year in the way that a race weekend is going to be structured and, and why? Well, um, we're fortunate, very fortunate in that we've got uh, a lot of interest in... in um, promoters and uh, countries having a Grand Prix and you know we've got some great races coming up we've got Saudi this year um, we had a race in Qatar and they're now looking at um, uh, what they do with the circuit for the future uh, next year we've got Miami of course which uh, we're very much looking forward to but there's um, there's a nice you know a very welcome upward pressure to have more and more races but there is a limit to what we can uh, achieve, what we can have the teams do. What we've found is that we're not getting any saturation from the fans. Um, you know, from the bulk of the fans, we're getting no message that, um, you know, we're having too many. They just want more. So we're trying to find that balance. And one of the things we wanted to do was to take a bit of load off the teams because with a um, conventional weekend, as we have now, they often arrive on a Monday or a Tuesday to start preparing. So if you finish a race and then you're almost straight into the next race, if it's a race consecutive weekends. So we've, we've compressed the, um, excuse me, we've compressed the weekend. So the practice only takes place on a Friday afternoon. Scrutineering takes place on a Friday morning. And the teams that are willing to can cut down their program by a day. Um, and therefore, um, and there will be curfews to stop them working excessive hours in the lead up to a race uh, at the trackers. 
the track and the lead up to a race. So it's really just try and make the weekend more efficient um, and compress the weekend a little bit. So we still have action on a Friday, but we have it in a way the teams, um, if they choose to, can, can achieve it um, with one day less time taken up. And, uh, and also, as you know, we've been experimenting with the sprint, which has been um, quite an exciting innovation, and that will fit into that uh, program as well. It's almost like you can see my notes. I was going to ask you about the sprint next because we've had three examples of it, kind of trials this year. Uh, and it's very easy to just look at some Twitter feedback and say, oh, it's a bit mixed. But you you really do delve into what the fans say. And also you have to take into account what commercial partners say and promoters say. So how successful has the sprint been, which for anyone who doesn't know, is when there's qualifying on a Friday evening to set the grid for a sprint race on the Saturday afternoon, which we call sprint qualifying. And then the result of that sprint race sets the grid for the Grand Prix. So how successful has that been from your perspective? And, and why was it so important to, to kind of look at those sorts of changes? Um, it's been very successful from our perspective. And it's true. We've, um, you know, any changes tend to be um, uh, you know, avid fans. You know, we have all sorts of fans watch from one. And avid fans are typically the sort who, who will... Uh, engage in Twitter and other social media to express their views and we respect that totally and it's great we have their feedback and so on but we also look at the feedback from all sorts of fans and the response to the sprint has been very strong we had a good event in Silverstone um, not such a good event in Monza that track didn't work or the the circumstances that weekend didn't work but then we had a great event in Brazil and it was, it was heightened by Lewis's uh, penalty starting from the back of the grid. So we had the spectacle of Lewis carving his way through the field in the sprint. Um, it gives us, first of all, it gives us a real event on a Friday because qualifying now takes place on a Friday. And that's actually where we've seen the massive change. Um, we've seen huge uptake on viewing figures and engagement on a Friday because we have the qualifying. We have something for people to watch from on for. Then this, we have the sprint. And in the case of Brazil, we had a very strong race. Monza wasn't so good. But so that is at least equaling what we used to get from qualifying, if not surpassing it. And then, of course, we have the race, which is still hasn't been cannibalized by any of what's gone on. So we have a proper three day event with promoters, sponsors, fans, everyone engaging for a full three days. And it builds up the weekend. You start to talk about it properly on a Friday. Um, you know, with all due respect, you know, Friday normally is for the real enthusiasts who want to know what tires people have, have run and how much fuel weight they've got and all the other things they're trying to work out. It's fascinating, but it appeals to a relatively small group of, of fans. And now suddenly we have action on a Friday, action on a Saturday culminating in the race and not cannibalizing the race. So we're really pleased with it and we want to take it forward uh, to next year to increase the number of events and refine the, uh, refine the, the events of the weekend and, and uh, rationalize some of the activities over the weekend to make it even better. So it's been a great uh, opportunity to try something different in Formula One without, um, you know, if it hadn't worked, we wouldn't have had too big an impact but this opportunity to have three races has been uh, a great initiative by the teams, the FIA and Formula One. I just want to pick up on, on something you've said there, because uh, it's interesting from your role, you, you know, you were a hugely successful engineer in Formula One. You've, you've had massive success and probably those details. Um, you were an avid fan and, and you loved that sort of thing. And now you're in a role where you have a huge appreciation for all that, but you're being asked to also expand the fan base and, and to kind of look beyond that to attracting new people. So how tough is it to balance the two in your position? It's not very tough at all, to be honest, because what I do know is the engineers will always prevail, whatever we do. Uh, that, you know, it's like the new cars. When the new cars came out, they were, they were howling about the fact that, you know, we were constraining them so much, all the cars would look the same. And then we launched the car uh, in the middle of the season and several of them said well our car doesn't look like that 
<laughs> so um, they, you know, however, however much space you give an engineer in Formula One, he will expand it. And so I have very little concern about um, uh, dumbing down the sport because they will, uh, they will find avenues and they will find opportunities to, to and that's how it should be. They should be uh, fighting to get a competitive advantage in every area they can. What we want to do is harness that to make it something the fans can really engage in uh, so that it's things they can see and they can understand and we can explain and we can show and we can make it a feature of Formula One because that's one of our greatest assets, this huge um, technological battle that's going on that we want the fans to appreciate and be part of. Um, strangely, though, I want to kind of finish with you in terms of looking back rather than forward, because we've talked about all the changes that are coming next year and, and what's ahead. But we're coming out of the COVID pandemic where it's, it's had a huge impact and you had to delay some of these changes because of that. But listening to Michael Andretti uh, speaking uh, in the same slot yesterday morning, he was saying that he felt from his team's perspective, it feels like they're out of the woods. Uh, is the same true of Formula One or is it taking a lot longer because of the global nature of the championship? Um, it's better. I think we have confidence now that we can deal with you know, what we think's ahead. Nobody knew COVID was ahead, so we have to be careful what we say. But I remember the despair after we came back from Australia, having had the race cancelled, and really not knowing what was ahead of us, you know, whether we would even ever race again. Nobody knew. Um, and we got through that. I have to say motor racing... Formula One and motor racing generally has the right uh, mindset for dealing with these issues and that we had to enter a, an era, we're still in it, of strict protocols. Uh, and we're used to that in Formula One. We operate with strict protocols um, for the teams to function properly and for the cars to be reliable and, and safe. And so we're used to having to follow rules and, and regulations and op, you know, even within the way we operated, forget COVID, but with the way we operated in the teams. So when we suddenly had to operate within this strict protocol of, of bio bubbles and having tests, it kind of felt, yeah, that's what we do normally. You know, we, we, we're just extending what we do. And I'm very proud of the way Formula One was able to respond. Um, Initially, we had the ventilator project, which you know, Formula One all got together and showed its uh, strength in helping develop new ventilators at a time when it was felt they were going to be vital. Um, it proved to be, fortunately, it proved to be a little less critical in the end. But, um, and then everyone worked together to, to enable us to find a way forward with um, uh, the challenge of COVID. And um, so, I certainly feel a lot more comfortable now, but you know, we, we've had a little hiccup with the Omicron variant that's now around and people are a little bit concerned about that. So you know, it's tightened up a little bit, um, but we, you know, we conduct um, five, four or 5,000 tests, COVID tests over a weekend. And if we, if we have, I can't think of many occasions when we've had more than double figures in terms of positives out of all those thousands of tests. And Mexico and Brazil, which were two races, which quite frankly, we were a little nervous of. Mexico, we had a, a handful and Brazil, we had nothing. Um, and so I think we have the discipline within the sport to survive. And um, it's not it's not quite as, we don't have the freedoms we used to have. And we're trying to, bring that back so our commercial partners, our sponsors, our promoters can have some more freedoms to, to do what they need to do. But yeah, we've, we've survived and um, we were probably the only international sport, to, we were the first international sport to get going and travel the world and not leave any trace of where we'd been. And that, that was vital to us. And we can go to a country and show the track record of what Formula One and motorsport is able to do and give them comfort that we can come into their country and hold a race and not have any, uh, not have any unfortunate impact. Now, I know you've got to shoot off in a sec to a very important meeting, but um, as that kind of preempts what the final question will be, actually, which is, as you sit here now, it, is it fair to say 
that a lot of the hard work's done? Or do you feel like a lot of it's still ahead because you've got the new rules in place for 2022 with the new cars, a new race weekend format, growth in key markets has been great. Certainly in North America, as we're talking to a lot of people from North America today, is it time to sit back and see how it all works out? Or is there a lot more to do on your plate? Well, no, the meeting I'm going to now is part of the initiative um, for sustainability and how we, we leverage the intense competition in Formula One and shape it into a direction that can have some relevance for the future. So we all know this massive environmental challenge we're all facing. And, you know, I know from my experience in Formula One, if you set the 10 teams uh, a challenge and make it competitive challenge. So what we're, we're discussing is sustainable fuels. So in 2026 at the latest and maybe even earlier, you will have to race with a sustainable fuel. In other words, a, a net carbon zero fuel. So the way that fuel is made, is produced, uh, has to be net carbon zero. And this will be a plug-in fuel that uh, you would be able to put into a road car. So it's another weapon in the fight against the, the environmental challenge. Um, electrification has its place. We believe sustainable fuels ha have their place. There's, you know, there's a, over a billion vehicles, getting on two billion vehicles on the road at the present time, and you can't get rid of them. So unless you find something which can be applied to those vehicles, then you're not going to have the impact you want. And we believe that Formula One can set an example of how a sustainable fuel can be uh, created and used. And that's the big thing we're working on now. So. Um, sustainability and the assistance and, and solutions we can find for the environmental challenge is the next phase of Formula One. And that's, um, but that's actually why we're seeing manufacturers take a much stronger interest in the sport because they can see the value of that involvement. And it's no secret to say Volkswagen with Porsche and Audi are having a very close look at Formula One, and that's one of the reasons why they're interested. And I think there'll be more. So that's our next. So there's no rest for the wicked, I'm afraid. I was going to say, I, I should certainly let you go then, but a lot of the comments have said you're the right man in the right seat in this role. And, and I think that's echoed across the industry. So how much uh, are you enjoying it and, and loving this role? Because it, like you say, it brought you out of retirement. Yeah, no, I, I enjoy it a great deal. I don't think, quite honestly, I could have gone back to the sort of white-hot competitive uh, um, role I had before. I see I see Christian and Toto on the pit wall, and I don't envy them at all, because <laughs> I know what they're going through. So this suits me really well at this stage of my life and my career. So um, it's very rewarding, very fulfilling. And... Um, and uh, I get to see cars race pretty often. And uh, I know I see the inside of what's going on. So it's, uh, it's, it's enough fun to make me want to keep doing it. Well, well, it's great to have you as part of the sport and to, to hear your thoughts today, Ross. I really appreciate it. And I've stolen a few minutes of the FIA's time for this uh, the meeting that you're meant to be in. So apologies uh, to Jean Tolenko no for when you head over there. Um, but thank you very much for joining us and for that great Pleasure. insight. Yeah, thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, Ross. Bye. Thank you very much, Ross, and uh, uh, you know, very yes. honor to to have you with us. And uh, and so we uh, we had a call right earlier, Chris, uh, from uh, uh, Ross's office uh, uh, that uh, he had an emergency meeting to go to, and so we couldn't reschedule, but at least we got uh, 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 about 35 minutes uh, from him and uh, what a delight. So we're bringing Paul Fanner with us right now and uh, we're going to carry on. Um, the next session uh, will uh, still be uh, talking Formula One because we're going to bring uh, our good friend Chris Ellett uh, from the MIA who has assembled a panel of some of the best people in the UK with Pat Simons, who is another incredible engineer and, and a terrific uh, racing entrepreneur, Peter Digby. I see Paul is back with us, Paul. Hey, that, great, that was fantastic, wow. Thank you, Chris Medlin, and thank you, Ross Broad. That, uh, um, it just, uh, for me, that shows me how far we've come in a year uh, with Online Race Industry Week. 
uh, th this really is a moment where the world comes together in motorsport. And what we were talking about as we closed, we were touching on the relevancy of Formula One going forward. Um, you, you're you know, literally there in that world. Uh, I have to ask you, is that something the entire community of Formula One is concerned about, or is that just the, uh, the owner of Formula One? No, no, that's that's certainly the whole community. Um, it's one of those funny things that, that Formula One never, never stops. And a lot of it goes in cycles. I mean, yeah, no racing ever stops. But the way the cycle seems to work, you feel like you write some of the, the same news stories at the same time each year. Yes. Uh, and there's certain ones that crop up a lot. And it's around the time of new regulations or the next set of engine rules, which engine rules they're talking about for in five, six years time. Yes. But trying to make them attractive to new entrants to big car manufacturers but to not hurt small independent teams it's always kind of the same issue but previously it's been because there's kind of been a free choice yeah uh, we went hybrid for 2014 and that was a big big step and it felt like a leap into the unknown a little bit at that point because that was committed to back in 2009 2010 yeah. so to then go to this stage where the whole world is looking at okay how do we focus on climate change how do we change of missions. There's so many different areas that, that really need seriously addressing and, and governments are taking QT seriously. As a sport, Formula One can't shy away from that. And you know, it's it's been a while since I've heard someone like Christian Horner who would say it quite regularly, let's just bring back screaming V12s and make this entertainment only, because it's clear that that just can't happen. The, the sport being kind of a bit of a technological leader um, on a lot of different things or, or trying to be, um, needs to do the same with, with its engine formula. And that's definitely something that's been a, a big discussion for quite a while now. Uh, and the teams do seem to be working together better on that front because I think having the direct influence from Liberty Media, from Formula One as a company, uh, has actually helped things because all the different main stakeholders really are working together to try and, and see where the future goes. And that's quite exciting. Uh, whereas, dare I say it, under Bernie Eccleston, as brilliant as it was that he built this huge sport, there was quite often a, a divide and conquer kind of approach, which meant that that kind of these uh, considerations didn't all come together and, and everyone didn't always work together in the best way. So uh, that's definitely changed under Liberty Media's ownership. Uh, and it's then exciting when you see big changes uh, after that. If, if we think, you know, Liberty haven't actually owned the sport for all that long. And, and when we spoke to Ross there, all of those changes that are coming in next year, that it's enormous what they're actually changing in terms of the sport, but but everyone's on board with it and excited to see how it works and, and ready to admit if certain things don't work and, and where they'll change again in future. Um, but yeah, we're seeing a real evolution now where, where the sport looks like it's going to be uh, ensuring it stays relevant, but stays attractive and stays a great racing category. And, uh, and I think that's uh, quite exciting to be a part of, but it also means, yeah, there's huge interest around it from everybody involved. Agreed. And, and I, I, again, really at the heart of this is, you know, we're in an era where mobility is changing globally and having been to the FIA offices, uh, you know, one of my friends and mentors is Nick Craw, who was president of the FIA Senate, uh, and just having some understanding of how the role that the FIA plays globally in, in mobility, um, there's no hiding from this. This is, this is a front and center issue for every auto manufacturer and the FIA anywhere there are laws in, in, involving environmental safety and, and you know, development and deployment of road cars. So Formula One, do you believe, is well positioned in what they're doing? Yeah, I do. It's funny you should bring up the FI, actually. I did a, an interview recently with Graham Stoker, who's one of the candidates for the presidency after Jean Todd, which, which will be running on Racer pretty soon. And uh, in that, he was saying about how he wants some continuity because he feels like the FIA is right now kind of starting to aid these changes. and. F F1 is a sports well placed, but that's a flagship sport for the FIA to kind of say, look, you know, look where this is going. But the influence they have, like you said, over the whole road car world uh, is enormous. So if they can take some of this kind of leadership or attempts to be technological leaders from Formula One and go, OK, but how do we really apply that to the real world? How is this more than just window dressing and you know, showing what we can do, but it's not realistic? We need to make sure it is realistic and transferable. Uh, and I think, again, that's that's another stakeholder that's aligned in that sense. And um, that, that means they are in a good place. It doesn't mean it will definitely be successful because you still need to put in a lot of hard work to, to make it work. Um, but I, I do think all the ingredients are there uh, and have been for some time now, actually, to make it successful. And, and as Ross says, I mean, when you've got big name brands, again, like Porsche and Audi from the Volkswagen Group looking uh, at Formula One and what it's doing and being interested by it at this stage, 
uh, at what is a crucial pivotal stage you know probably quite tough for a brand like that to say at this point when there's so much uncertainty about the future of mobility shall we invest a lot of money in formula one if you can attract them at this point that shows uh, how well positioned you are i agree with you and and uh if you have a story to tell and you're on an adventure to the future you know i think that makes some sense i think uh you know, one of my uh, uh, favorite kind of maxims that uh, that came out of a No Fear Clothing ad years ago, a headline I wrote, was uh, victory travels at the speed of thought. Uh, and that's the essence of Formula One. And, uh, you know, it the, the engineering and the mindset of Formula One is uh, managing change faster and better than your opponent. Um, and that is in the moment in a race, and that's between seasons, and that's between races. And now we're in between eras in mobility, uh, and I'm glad to see Formula One's in a place like that. I think culturally, I want to talk a minute while we have you here. Um, you know, yesterday I watched a fascinating panel at the end of the day uh, with Chris Stewart, founder of Grid Life, which is this hybrid track event, music event, cultural event. And he kept, it was interesting to listen to Chris because one enthralling conversation about managing the energy of the audience and of the experience. Everything I've heard of all my friends, I did not go to CODA this year, but I had so many of my friends, many of them first-timers who went to CODA, and they kept talking about the energy. Do you see a change in the kind of emotional, cultural energy at a Formula One race under the era of Liberty Media ownership than what you saw previously? And what's responsible for that if it's true? And I absolutely do. Um, and, it, and it's not just in the U.S. either, but uh, the U.S. was a great example of it. CODA was just such a big event. And there was like, that was almost like a bit of a release because Formula One itself had actually gone a little bit more loose on its restrictions after COVID. Things were just getting a slightly more normal again. And all of that came together perfectly to allow this huge event to happen. Um, that was just, yeah, just a great celebration the whole way through. A, a lot of people said that, that that were there, that it didn't matter actually that they, they still got a great race to watch. Um, you know, we had Lewis chasing down Max and it was a thriller, but it kind of didn't matter by the time the lights went out you know they'd had a brilliant weekend and that's what you want people to do and and to be honest this year the first place i saw that was at zandvoort where they had a, a full crowd for that for max verstappen essentially um that's that's orange, an old school circuit <laughs> sorry say again i said i love orange by the way that yeah, showed yeah. Up there. <laughs> you, you need you, Go yeah on. i was gonna say you need to be a fan of orange to to be at that race as well i mean everyone was wearing it you were handed these orange capes as you walked in um, but a lot of that is because there's almost a commercial aspect to that. You know, someone can create a very cool uh, orange bland, branded top. It turned out there were um, soccer World Cup tops um, from the Dutch national team. But the the way that that then allowed them to create this amazing atmosphere and they could fill gaps with music and they would just focus on giving the fans a good time comes from a freedom from Liberty Media to say, you're the promoter, you do what fits your market best. Whereas at times under Bernie Eccleston, different way of working that still worked well for him was to say, no, I need full control. I tell you what you can and can't do because I'm not going to let something that either devalues something I want to do happen or maybe treads on the toes of someone else. I, I, you know, I'm keeping full control. I'm really limiting what you can do. And you know, there's still enough interest from other places that wanted to host F1. They're like, yep, yeah, we'll still sign up to those rules. But a lot more freedom has come since Liberty has taken over. They've seen the value of the event in terms of once you walk in the gate to the second you walk out, it's more than just the two hours of racing. There's so much more that goes on that you need to provide to fans. And that's something we've seen a, a lot of. And, and it's been very, very cool to be a part of actually and to see. Um, and, and you find yourself more and more often actually going to a racetrack, walking to Zandvoort, I'll admit. Quite often you wanted to turn left and go into a grandstand and join the party rather than go into the media centre, which is very rare for me to say because I'm in such a privileged position. But uh, yeah, it was it was incredible. And, and the same with Kota. You just kind of, you looked at people that were having a good time and thought, yeah, this, I want to be a part of that still. So um, yeah, I think that to me is the pinnacle of a big event. I was at the Indy 500 this year as well. I, um, that was a, a great Thank experience. You. It was my first race week. Uh, to be there and I know it wasn't a full crowd but just standing um, on pit road and, and the noise and watching Elio win and seeing the day that fans had I was just as jealous of them as they would have been of where I was standing so I think that is probably if you can get that balance that create that kind of environment then you're onto something good and I think that's something Liberty Media have started to do as well. They do and I think what they do is they uh, they bring the, the place they're at to Formula One at the same time they're bringing Formula One to the place they're at. And 
you know, there's a, another belief I have is that the audience owns you, not the other way around when you're in this business. And there seems to be a recognition that this is being created, not just for the competitors, but for the audience that's devoted to it and the amplification of the audience's presence in this conversation seems to be at the center of what Formula One is doing. Absolutely. It's something that Ross just said, wasn't it? That the yeah. way that uh, engineers will always find a way, they, they will always expand on things. They, they will deal with whatever you give them. Previously, Formula One, I think, listened too much to the teams, to, to the, those involved, uh, yeah. and not enough to those watching that you were kind of doing it for. So having that liberty influence where they've gone, no, this is, this is our wheelhouse, is to get... Uh, fans engaged to make sure they're having the best time that they can have uh, and hopefully bring more fans in and we'll give we'll give the teams some of what they want but a lot of the other stuff they don't know they don't actually know what they want you know once they see that there's there's suddenly all huge superstars that there's more money coming in commercially because the fan base has grown they're going to be happy with what they're being asked to do and at the end of the day they're still creating these amazing amazing racing cars and putting on a great show on track so yeah i think that's that's been a big big influence from liberty's point of view Agreed. Uh, and you know, one of the other things we see through your, you know, your good work too, Chris, is that you know the audience in our platforms is is getting younger, um, and the above sixty five proportion is dramatically contracted in the last uh, year and a half. And this eight, eighteen to twenty four is the fastest growing consistently through pandemic, through the uh, embrace of esports, through I think interest in Formula One. Um, we saw a major surge, uh, I, something like I, I've not seen this before when Peretta Autosport tried to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. Both days of, of that team trying to qualify for the Indy 500 were equal to or greater than the actual coverage day of the Indianapolis 500 in terms of interest. We saw a spike in female interest. What is Formula One going to do about that? How are they going to capture female audience in proportion to the male audience? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? In one sense, they've started to do it, and and it came from there was there was no social media coverage or access uh, in terms of Formula One in the Bernie era. Um, you know, yeah. he didn't understand how you can monetize social media, so didn't kind of give any freedom to it, uh, and that's changed over the last few years. And there's been a huge boom. Formula One boasts quite often that it's had the fa it's the fastest growing uh, international sport or major sports uh, league uh, in terms of social media numbers now. That, that's true, but it's also quite easy to achieve from the low bar that it started at. But from doing that, it's just opened up the world to so many more people. Uh, and as you say, we then see it with with the metrics that we have on the website or when it's uh, other work that we're doing, that you've got a, a much better balance. Now, it's also been able then to use those platforms to tell the stories of the inspirational women that do work in F1 uh, and that they're not just in kind of stereotypical roles that maybe have been damaging to, to think of in the past. It's yes. anything is possible for them. Uh, it's been a bit sad recently, actually, that we, we had two team principals that were female or, you know, in the Claire Williams example, it was deputy team principal. Yes. Um, and at, at this point, you know, it was, it's been a really sad weekend um, to lose Sir Frank. Uh, we had the news that came through on Sunday that, that he passed away and, um, it was a shame to see the Williams family step back, but the time for them was right to step back from Formula One. And with that, the last female uh, sort of leader of an F1 team disappeared when we'd had a, a spell where we had two out of the 10 teams were led by, by females with Manisha Calton born at Salva as well. And having those role models, I think, was important and will hopefully be important in future. So they, they need to do a bit more of that. They need to make sure that, uh, that some of these uh, op opportunities that had been opening up don't get ignored just because metrics are getting better, if that makes sense. Just because things are improving, you don't stop trying to make them improve. Um, but yeah, I think they've opened the door to a, a lot more just interest um, from, like you say, a younger audience. And if you can get younger females interested in the sport, there's more of a chance that they're going to move into it uh, professionally as well in the future. And we have another you know, topic that is front and center because perhaps the greatest racing driver of this era and of all time is a person of color. And we have the Hamilton Commission uh, and the findings of the Hamilton Commission. And, you know, as, as, uh, as the saying, if you can see it, you can be it. Uh, we have the aspirational target at the very top of our sport uh, that speaks to more than one race, one, you know, one ethnic background, one origin story. What do you think the future of Formula One with its diverse uh, audiences around the world, diverse social media streams, just who it touches globally, 
Uh, how do you think Formula One is going to evolve uh, in terms of its culture to be more inclusive? I, I think it's definitely going to become much more inclusive. I think they, they've tried to send that messaging out on a very broad basis. We've, we've seen it. We have um, the We Race as One gesture um, and a quality gesture before every race, um, which I know a lot of sports are doing something similar now, but um, there's actual kind of codes of conduct and um, there's, there's full on documents now that I actually had to approve some the other day that are showing how we're going to try and improve opportunities for minorities. And as you say, I mean, having Lewis as a figurehead for this is, is brilliant. Um, but sometimes it's asking a bit much of him to to do it all himself. And he he likes to take on the responsibility, but he needs support from others. And what's been great to see is that buy in from different stakeholders. And I think that's been crucial. Mercedes are a key one. You know, it's obviously Lewis's team, but changing the livery on the car is one of the most visually striking things you can do. And for anyone who sees that, you know, from one year to the next, they're going to go, well, why did they do that? They're going to get a, a good bit of knowledge about this story, about what's trying to be told. Uh, I think the regions we're going to race in as well, just having a, a global sport gives you the opportunity to have. Uh, different nationalities, different people coming in and, and being involved in the race at, at different levels, you know, be it drivers. I mean, we've got Guan Yu Zhou coming in as a, a, the first Chinese racing driver next year yes. um, for Alfa Romeo. Very exciting. Just, yeah, those opportunities are, are a big thing because you see them at the very top. But further down, there are, there are good examples too. And I think it's just all about inspiring people to say, you know, the, these avenues are open, but it that doesn't always allow them to get to where they want to go because you know the background they come from might just not allow them to get to a certain school that then lets them do a certain subject that will lead on to the degree you need to be in formula one and now formula one's putting money in as lewis is with the hamilton commission to say right we're going to try and open up those avenues we're going to fund scholarships we're going to try and give excellence it's still got to be excellent but we're going to give excellence a chance that maybe wouldn't have got a chance before um and i think at this stage it's very key it is funding that's going to do that you know you it's all, it's all well and good saying what needs to happen, but if you don't facilitate it by um, taking away the financial barriers, uh, then it's never going to happen. You know, it's just lip service. So I think that financial uh, input and, and Chase Carey, I think, put in a big donation himself into this uh, just last year. I think it was a million dollars he put into the project. Wow. Um, it's been great to see. And all of that shows that there's, there's a serious desire to try and improve the situation in that sense. That's, that's great. Uh, and thank you. Uh for all that insight. I, I, I think that our sport belongs to everyone. Uh, and what I love about our sport uh, is that uh, it doesn't care what gender you are, what national, you know, if you can do it, and you can do it to the very you know, highest level performance, you belong at least participating in the sport. And certainly as a fan, this speaks to the human journey, you know, uh, the human adventure. You know, uh, uh, what racing is, is, is you know, it, it, it is, uh, the two extremes of risk and reward. And it's evident for car companies, for humans, uh, for technology, everything. And where, where I see where we're at in this, you know, as we are about to embark on this new era of Formula One, is this digital forward stance that uh, uh, Liberty Media has taken has just made the sport broadly accessible. Um, and you know you're working in a space where you know much of your your work is is viewed digitally. What do you think that means? What's the contrast? Because you worked in the pre digital world of Formula One. What is I the did, difference you feel now? I, I did. It was quite funny though. I, I when I first really uh, was getting into Formula One, sort of online media weren't accepted. We we weren't allowed to be accredited uh, okay. as websites because uh, oh, yeah. again we're still talking about the Bernie <laughs> era, but. Uh, they just weren't, uh, he, he was worried the way that, you know, he couldn't charge a fee to have a website come and cover the sport. The same with print uh, outlets, he couldn't charge them to come and get accreditation. So he was worried about giving up more uh, access to the sport in a strange way because he wanted to control it and monetize it. And once that was freed, I think, that's another reason we've had such a, such a boom recently is because there's so many more ways of people being able to find Formula One. And it will be the same, I'm sure, with other other motorsport categories but if you give more channels uh, more opportunities for people to find different niches as well you know you get some incredible technically savvy people that do a, a very specific technical website um you might not get a race report on it but you will get you know a detailed drawing of the of the red bull rear wing or the mercedes rear wing that's causing controversy and for people that are really interested in that they've got an outlet and then similarly there's some that are more like gossip columns but again that's going to hit another audience and by being able to use 
uh, the digital space and the fact that there is so much space to then use, uh, yeah. it, it just means you hit a much, much wider audience and you can hit them specifically. It's not just throwing out a net and seeing who you catch. It's, it's you can target different areas of that audience. And I think that's been very important is having that kind of ability to do that as a sport and kind of go, OK, what are we going to tailor to these people? What are we going to tailor to these people? You know, these fans want this. These fans want that. Um, we have the space to do it rather than if you say you've got a TV channel and you've got two hours and that's it. You know, you've, you've got to pick and choose what goes on there. Or if you've got a newspaper, you've got to pick and choose what goes into it. And, and we see it with the magazine, the choices we make on different editions and issues. Like you've got to make editorial calls and sometimes stuff gets left out because there's not space over something else. The online world and, and the digital space that we now have is, is pretty much infinite, um, <laughs> cost permitting, and that allows you to, to do more. So I think it's just expanded uh, the way the sport can the talk and the messaging it can give out. Agreed. And, and I think the most important thing that it's done, this new era here, is it's on all the time. And you don't have to uh, you literally turn on your phone or your computer and it's there. And I'm sometimes astonished to, when I'm an insomniac, so I'm up in the middle of the night, there'll be certainly several hundred people in the, at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Sometimes if there's a big story, there'll be a thousand people in a given second looking at, a, at stories and many times I, I can look at what the story sources are and it's Formula One many times it's a social media driven social Formula One story and I just realized that being on 24-7 365 is the biggest change I've seen to Formula One in in my lifetime yeah it, it's and it's certainly you know it, it's not you know the internet's not new but the way that Formula One's embraced it is actually relatively new. The way it's allowed yeah, it's so, so much to happen. It's so late. Yeah. Yeah. And it, cause it then takes time for certain outlets to be able to grow to a point of being able to provide that content and that coverage. Uh, they can't just do it overnight and click their fingers and walk into the paddock. So, uh, yeah, I think the sport opening itself to that world fully. Uh, and now, I mean, you know, people can watch highlights on, on the Formula One YouTube channel and they can, yeah. they can watch certain shows on an OTT platform. There's just so much more to consume. Uh, that I think has been a, a real positive that's taken a lot of investment um, from stakeholders like ourselves, but also from Liberty Media as as the uh, the sport itself uh, to really try and make sure that more and more people can access it. And Formula One's app and you know, app service is just fantastic. And many of my friends are, are subscribers to it. And it's uh, and for someone, you know, uh, who's uh, like the addicted to the sport, it's the right thing. You know at the right time and they've done a very good job of evolving and improving it uh you know and, and you know your work for us chris before we we move on is is so appreciated by our team uh you're our eyes and ears in this world and uh and your willingness to engage in american motorsport and be part of our team at the indy 500 the fact you went to the barber test you know it just shows that all of us who love racing are uh, are together in building this sport and in love of it uh, uh, and, and devoted to it. And thank you so much for being uh, uh, the you know, the shining example of what's possible for us. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, I absolutely love doing it. There's a, there's a lot of cool things you get to do in this world and you have to pinch yourself sometimes when you're in certain positions watching sure. some incredible events and races. And yeah, I'm following Ross across to Saudi tomorrow as well. We have yeah. the last two for racer on the ground. But um, I should have really actually had a go at him for the timing of next year's schedule. That's one thing we didn't cover, but uh, the uh, the Indy 500 clashing with Monaco once again, meaning I can't come to the 500 this time round. But um, I think that makes for a great day of motorsport as well. And that's for fans, you know, every now and then I'll complain as somebody who works in it that I can't get to the two events in one day. But for fans, it's an incredible day of racing. And, and that's when you see Formula One as well is, is a world that some people think is um, a bit sheltered or isn't full of people with the same drive and passion but it 100% is every Sunday afternoon. Admittedly, we're in Monte Carlo, so it's, it's a great place to be, but people are piling in to a bar called Stars and Bars or into team motorhomes to watch the Indy 500. They're, they're, they're kind of stopping working and doing that because they want to watch racing. It's a huge race. And, that, and that's what everyone shares. That's a, that's a core asset of everyone's passion. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll be doing that next year and uh, I love doing it. And you, you Thank you, Chris. This. The concept for ePart Trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for ePart Trade is actually quite obvious. 
Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At ePartrade there is no e-commerce, it's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. There are two types of people, racers and everyone else. Racer Magazine is for those who believe that racing is a way of life. Racer embodies the excellence that defines a sport driven by passion, courage, and ingenuity. Get one year of both Racer's print and digital edition for only $39 with instant access to our entire digital issue archive. Subscribe now at info.racer.com.